is Indian country today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholahungva. One Arizona tribal college is offering free tuition to some students. The Tana Atham Community College is giving Native students free courses this summer. The classes are available online, and there are three summer sessions to choose from. The first session starts on June 1st. More tribes are reopening casinos as states also start to reopen. This marks the first full week of business for the Miccosukee tribe in Florida. A notice on the tribe's website says every employee returning to work has tested negative for COVID-19. The casino is operating on reduced hours, no longer being open 24-7, and only 500 pa patrons at a time will be allowed inside. There is one designated entry and one designated exit, and before casino guests can enter, they must first have their temperature taken, and they must also wear a face covering. Smoking is not allowed inside the casino, however, they are providing smoking areas outside. Finally, dispensers for disinfectant wipes are placed around the casino floor. Guests must wipe down each machine after they play. A casino worker in Oklahoma is sent home after testing positive for COVID-19. The Lucky Star Casino is owned by the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribe. Governor Reggie Wasana issued a memo saying the employees' work areas were sanitized and the person is now in self-quarantine at home. The governor says the decision to continue operations was based on consultations with medical staff and following CDC guidelines. He adds, those guidelines are changing, so they are keeping an eye on any updates, and now all casino guests are required to wear face coverings. Now for the latest numbers of COVID-19, let's go to Jordan bennett Begay, our Washington editor. Jordan? So Patty, five tribes reported additional cases and two tribes announced their first COVID-19 cases. The latest numbers from our database show that there are now a total of 6,152 positive confirmed cases and 184 deaths within the Indian health system. Again, that's a total of 6,152 positive confirmed cases and 184 deaths as of this morning. And as you mentioned, in Oklahoma, the casino that's owned and operated by the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes found an employee who tested positive, and that employee was also asymptomatic. So that's something um, you know, casinos or other entities will have to look out for in the future as they want to reopen. In Wisconsin, the La Cordaine Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians reported their first case within their community. And the Choctaw Nation in Oklahoma now has a total of 111 positive confirmed cases. The tribe reported eight more cases within their tribal jurisdiction. And we also confirmed the numbers in Yakima Nation in Washington State. The tribe announced they have 90 positive confirmed cases with four being hospitalized and three deaths within their community. And the tribe also said approximately 500 people have tested positive, or have been tested, excuse me. And the Navajo Nation you know, that spans across Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico reported 100 new cases and two additional deaths. Uh, tribal officials say now this gives the tribe a total of 4,253 cases and 146 deaths uh, for their nation. And in Arizona, the White Mountain Apache tribe uh, announced uh, 39 more cases. And this gives the tribe a total of 487 cases. And lastly, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians in Mississippi reported 22 new cases, and they now have a total of 352 cases. And of those total cases, Patty, 214 are active, which means those individuals are currently ill, and 138 have recovered from the virus. So we're seeing, again, as more testing becomes available, those numbers of positive COVID-19 cases are going up. And, um, and it's also important to remember that balance of how many people have recovered from uh, the coronavirus. Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, the Navajo Nation does say about now they have a, a little over a thousand uh, people who have recovered from this illness and they're still, you know, in implementing their curfews and their requiring face masks when the people go out um, in the public for groceries and medicine. Any word on if the Navajo Nation is going into another shutdown this weekend? Uh, last weekend, they closed all their grocery stores, their gas stations, convenience stores, everything in an effort to keep people home. Yes, they do have another curfew coming up. I'm not sure about the closed businesses at this point. 
Thank you, Jordan Benabigay. Yeah. And we'll be right back. Welcome back. Since we launched our newscast on April 6th, in the middle of this pandemic, we've had a chance to talk to some amazing guests, like John Harrington. He's Chickasaw Indian and was the first Native American astronaut. John Harrington spent 14 days aboard the International Space Station. He's someone who knows a little bit about true isolation. In April, he talked about how we can stay home and stay safe in this pandemic. We hope you enjoy this Encore interview with John Harrington. Hey, Patty. Thank you so much for having me. Nice to be here. Nice to be here on Earth Day and uh, talking about your spacewalk and what it took. You spent 14 days in space and no way could you reach out and hug your family or talk to your friends uh, in person. What was that like? Well, you're so busy. I mean, it's one of these things that you're so focused on what you do that other things kind of, kind of disappear into the background. But when you have time, which we did towards the end of the mission, I got on the computer, I got to, uh, I wasn't FaceTime, it was a video link with my kids. And so I could, I could lean on the, on the wall. I was actually on the wall like this. And I looked like I was, you know, in the right orientation, but I was sideways and talking to my kids on a computer. So uh, you can do that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you, you said something about keeping busy. Yes, you were on a mission, uh, but you were all the way up in space, you know, so, was there any fear? I mean, that's, how many miles away were you? Well, you know, you're 200 and I think 220 miles, roughly 220 miles above the surface. If you can imagine the earth is a 16 inch diameter beach ball. We are one finger width above it. That's about, that's as high as a space shuttle and the space station is in orbit. But to stay there, you have to be doing 17,500 miles an hour because gravity is always pulling you back to earth. It's the really neat thing about earth. It's not flat, it's round. And as gravity pulls you back to Earth, you're going so fast that you're in this constant, really essentially a constant free fall around the Earth. Wow. So for people here who are going through this pandemic and being told stay at home, mm -hmm. um, what's your advice to them? Yeah, one of the things that I, it didn't really dawn on me. I mean, maybe it did in space a bit, but sitting here at the house and socially isolating and knowing that, you know, the bad stuff's out there. And then in the space station, in the space shuttle, what's outside the walls are the, is what can kill you. And so what you have to do is mit really mitigate the risk to you by, you know, practicing your work, what you're going to do. When you go outside and do a spacewalk, be very careful, be very diligent. Um, don't do a rambling around and do things because you can get hurt. And I put that into the exact same perspective here. You know, I can go to town and I can get some milk and I can get my food and get toilet paper now too. Um, but, you know, how much risk are you willing to take? You can go out there and, and hug people. Or are you going to go out and without a mask on? And, you know, I closed on a house I had in Idaho and I went into the title company with glasses on, with a mask on and gloves. And I, cause I, you know, I have asthma and I have bronchitis. And so I'm in that and I'm elderly too, you know, <laughs> so I'm in that, that high risk category. So I just kind of relate it to when I was in space that the bad stuff's on the outside. And if you're going to go outside, make sure that you mitigate the risk to you to getting sick, because it's not just you. It could be a family member. It could be somebody else in a crew. And that's, you just have to pay attention to it. So that's a good point too. talking about making things safe for not just yourself, but your crew members. Mm -hmm. And in this case, that would be our families. And well, friends. we quarantine. Matter of fact, before we fly, we quarantine for seven days because they want to make sure that we're not going to carry any, any sickness to space. And so we have flight docs that pay attention to us. Anybody that's around us has had a physical. Anybody around us, you know, if they're sick, they can't come around us. If you have somebody, I think if your kids are 15 years or younger, it doesn't matter if they're healthy or not. 
they just can't come around you because they're the ones that carry most of the bugs, you know, because they're in school all the time. So um, we quarantine before we go to space. Matter of fact, one of my friends just flew to space, space station on the uh, Russian, on the Soyuz last week. And he was quarantined for a month before he went. And the flight doc that's working with him is quarantined for a month when he comes, you know, when he comes back to the States. And so, you know, we all have to be very careful about, um, you know, about what we can catch and not pass around to somebody else. That's um, it's interesting correlations. You know, you think about your spacesuit and, and the um, uh, head covering, all of that is your PPE to the max. That's, <laughs> that's a good point. It is my PPE. And it's a, you ask, where's my spacesuit? Well, if I had $12 million, I would have a spacesuit with me. But it is, it's your own little spaceship. So when you go outside and do a spacewalk, if you did not have that on, you know, things would get bad really, really quickly. And so that's the idea is that you're in your own contained environment and you're just, uh, you know, you're protecting yourself essentially. Your equipment you did, is. Yeah, and you did three spacewalks and you did uh, repairs to the International Space Station. Yeah, uh, three spacewalks uh, every other day. So once we docked, we had to get stuff together. And then uh, second, the first spacewalk was a couple days after we were there. Another day we had off, well off. I transferred cargo back and forth on my the days I didn't spacewalk. Uh, but uh, did three of them, I think about roughly about 20 hours total um, going outside. I recorded all of your spacewalks on, um, back then it was VHS tape, <laughs> because NASA had it all live. Yeah. And, um, I, and I, I still have those VHS tapes, John. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. And I, uh, it's neat that there's a, uh, some of the astronauts are taking GoPros now. So when you go oh, out on a spacewalk, you have a GoPro. I would love to have had a GoPro on my mission. I had two, I had a helmet cameras and they were wireless video. And so it's not, it really wasn't that, that good a video, but you see the GoPro now and you go, wow, that's, that's exactly what it looks like. Are you asking us to go back up? <laughs> I'm old. I'm elderly. <laughs> That's somebody else's job. I, I got to do, you know, I flew once in space. I like to have flown more, uh, but I got to do everything I would ever do as an astronaut on my one mission. So I, I was very fortunate that the time did, because the mission after mine was Columbia. You know, and I, I lost some of my friends on Columbia and I lost three classmates. So, you know, we didn't fly for a couple, you know, about two and a half years. And then uh, I was offered a job uh, with a company in Oklahoma to be a test pilot and fly people in space maybe twice a week. And so I made a really, really tough decision to leave and I regret it to some extent because my friends kept flying and, uh, you know, but that's, you know, we all make decisions based on what we have at hand. And that's what I did. Right. And, and, and that's a good reminder. STS-113, uh, you flew in Endeavor and that was truly the last successful um, uh, space shuttle flight. Well, we were the last launch at night uh, until, until many years later. The last one was STS-135 flew in 2011. And there were four, uh, well, actually two folks on board were my classmates. And uh, Rex Walheim and Sandy Magnus, they got to fly uh, to the space station. It was 2011. So hopefully in May, uh, we'll get to launch two Americans, uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Binken, Dr. Bob and Chunks, we call them, um, to, uh, to the space station on the SpaceX Dragon. Yes. A lot of people are turning to traditional healing uh, you know, herbs and such, you know, we, we're talking a lot about how many of us are boiling our cedar tea and other things. Um, when you went into space, you took some, some things that were special to you as a Chickasaw. Yeah, I, I took quite a few things, actually. I certainly took a flag for the, for the tribe. I presented that to uh, Governor Anatubby when I came back. Uh, I flew a flute. There were two things that I could take out in my mission. And my commander said, John, pick very carefully because everything else is going to be packed away. You never see it. Uh, but two things you can actually take out. And so one was an eagle feather that was given to me by uh, Phil Lane Sr. Uh, Phil was an elder with the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. His son, Phil Lane Jr., uh, is also an elder right now with uh, ACES. And then uh, the feather was really funny. <laughs> the first feather he gave me was about, was about this big. And he goes, well, you're a little astronaut. You haven't flown yet, so here's a little feather. <laughs> and that actually came out of a car that was hanging from the rearview mirror in the parking lot. And, uh, and the, then later on, he gave me this beautiful eagle feather, was beaded Mother Earth and Father Sky and all the people of the world. And, and that's in the Smithsonian uh, Museum of the American Indian. And then the flute, I flew a uh, black cedar flute. Stand by. Standing by. Standing by. We also liked your um, shuttle uh, 
items Probably in the back there. An identical cedar flute to this, black lacquer cedar flute uh, made by Jim Gillian. Uh, it was a Cherokee uh, Indian, uh, was an engineer at the Kennedy Space Center. And he, uh, that's in the Smithsonian as well now. And this is a, this is a replica. I was out with uh, an event with Carlos Nakai and, uh, and uh, I wanted to, he wanted to play my flute in the Smithsonian, they wouldn't let him. So I contacted Jim, I said, hey, can you make Carlos a flute? So he made Carlos a flute and gave me another one. So this is great. Nice. So things that, uh, that are, are close to you and have huge cultural significance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I flew some sage, I flew some sweet grass. Um, I flew um, uh, a uh, regalia for a friend of mine, some feathers from his regalia, his traditional dancer, and his grandfather. So they were over 100 years old. Wow. And I flew those. It was a great grandfather. But yeah, I flew those for him and, and uh, gave them back to him. And, uh, you know, little toys for my kids and some jewelry and stuff. But, uh, but the significant things were being able to take the flute and the feather out and actually you know, float those into the space station and the space shuttle and take photos of them. That was really meant a lot to me meant a lot to my family, I hope. Absolutely. And, and I think, again, when we're in this pandemic and, and we're looking for that comfort, um, culture is a big part of that, to really reach that back out and to embrace your culture in, in whatever way you can and, um, and, and be a little more settled. Um, so the, um, the re-entry to Earth. Now, here's my correlation. You said that coming back into Earth felt like, like somebody had put a sack of potatoes on you or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So as we come out of this uh, pandemic and stay-at-home orders, you know, you're seeing a lot of people baking and cooking, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm I'm craving soda. I hardly ever drink soda, and I'm craving soda now. So um, I'm worried about coming back out of this pandemic. You know, heavy. <laughs> I get heavy in this pandemic. You know, I sit here, I've got, I got can candy. Over. I'm a candy holic. It's terrible. Um, and one of the things that I found, I found this in space. I find this when I go on long river trips or I'm going camping for a couple of weeks. I do a lot of stuff in Alaska up on North Slope. Uh, and I, you take comfort foods. You take things that, you know, when things are tough, you know, there's something you can, you can have as comfort as a part of that. And for me, I take jelly beans. You know, I used to, I like to take jelly bellies. Um, and, and that's, it's fun because you don't slam them down all the time, but you know, it's, it's nice to get some comfort out of it. And in space, I, we had M&Ms, we had, uh, I think I had Babe Ruth candy bars. Uh, I had peanut butter, I love peanut butter. So those type of things you have as part of that, uh, you know, ability to cope, I think. And it doesn't hurt as long as you don't overindulge, which mm -hmm. I do sometimes. <laughs> well, comfort food there. Now the, um, um, when you came back a couple of years after your mission, you then went into training that took you underwater for 10 days. What was that about? That was, uh, it's called NEMO, and NEMO is an acronym, NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations. Not the, not the orange fish, not NEMO the fish, but there's a habitat in Key Largo uh, that was run by the uh, University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And it's a, it's a habitat that's down about 60 feet uh, below the surface. And so NASA was using that as a way to give astronauts or folks that haven't flown yet a, an idea of what it's like to be isolated, what it's like to be in an environment where uh, going outside is, you know, could be bad. And so, and to work together as a team. And so I commanded uh, uh, two other astronauts and an engineer and then two HAB technicians. So I spent 10 days in Key Largo underwater just off the coast. And uh, the neat thing about that is once you go down, you get nitrogen saturated. So if you run out of air when you're scuba diving, you do not go to the surface because it may be where air is, but you'll get, you'll get bent because you have a lot of nitrogen in your blood. And so, you know, the surface is not your friend. And so it's really good space flight analog because you have to go out and do spacewalks, you go out and do scuba dives. It's a hazardous, hazardous environment, close quarters. Uh, it's wet, it's not wet in space, but it's wet there. And, uh, and you learn and you do experiments and exactly like you would do in space, except it's a lot cheaper and uh, it's a lot wetter. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the uh, getting out there and getting back is not that difficult. You're on a boat. <laughs> yeah, but that's, those are extremes, you know, spending 10 days underwater and then, you know, uh, two weeks up in space. Um, again, you know, we're being told to stay at home. Is that hard? Well, once again, I, I had something to do. I was, I was busy. And when you're not busy, you find that you have time on your hands. 
So how do you occupy the time you have? I'm fortunate. I live in the mountains of Montana now. I live uh, west of Kalispell. I live on a little runway. Um, my closest neighbor is a quarter mile away. And that's, you know, I, I can walk outside. I can walk the dog. I can, I can be outside, but I don't have a lot of people around me. And I'm, I'm okay with that. I'll get on my bike and I'll go for a ride. Um, I, mean, I put my rat bear spray on my handlebar when I <laughs> go up in the mountains. Um, so it's, you know, it can be hazardous, but um, yeah, I just, I find something to do. Cause if you can't find something to do, you know, you'll get, you will get bored and that's not, that's not good. Yeah. That's um, that I think it's really important to remind people that the idea of find something to do, uh, whether it's reading a book, whether it's, you know, doing some kind of workout in your home or, you know, whatever it can be. And um, just so that you have that uh, sense of, of um, I don't know, not, not so much accomplishment, but just that, that you are keeping somewhat productive. Well, the challenge, and what's, I think the challenge, it's not a challenge for me because I'm, I'm here. It's me. My kids live, um, my, my youngest daughter lives about three hours away, and I have grandkids. I'd love to go see them. I would love to, but I told my daughter, I said, right now I just can't, you know, because there's a risk in doing that. As much as I love my kids, I, I can FaceTime, which is fabulous. I can FaceTime with my kids, I, you know, and, and that's nice, but the idea is at what point in time do I want to expose myself to that, you know, to that, to the virus? I may have had it. I was really sick in February. I mean, really sick. I, I was tested negative for the flu, respiratory illness. The doctor thought I had pneumonia, he gave me medicine for that. Um, but I don't know. He didn't, he didn't know either. So, you know, I'd like to find out, get an antibody test and find out if I actually was, a, I did have it. That'd be nice to know. But that kind of gives you a little bit more confidence. And when you go outside, you're not, you're not going to be as exposed to the virus as you would, you would think so. Right. I think a lot of people are in that uh, same uh, boat and thinking that they, they, you know, they're listening to the symptoms now and saying, gosh, I went through that. So <laughs> I had that. I, I, I had it. All those symptoms. Yeah, very much so. Oh my goodness. Your, your dad talked a little bit about something about rising to the challenge um, when you were growing up. Uh, today, this is our challenge. How do we rise to this challenge? You know, pay attention to the scientists. Pay attention to the people that understand what this is all about. You know, you hear there's so much noise on the internet. There's so many things. There's so much noise on the TV, you know. And as, as Native people, I think the important thing is we've, we have a history of listening to people with knowledge. We have a history of listening to people that know. And, and that is what we have to do. And so if we have people that say, hey, you need to do this, because if you don't do this, this bad stuff is gonna happen. They're, they're saying that because they have a, an in-depth knowledge from years of experience. And we listen to our elders that say, do this because you know, bad stuff can happen. You have to be able to say, I value that. You know, the other noise you're hearing is maybe for a different reason, and as, an, as you know, conscious, uh, uh, educated adults, we have to understand and, and make right decisions. Value the science, value the data that's out there, because if you don't, you can get harmed, your family can get harmed, you know, and the economies could get worse than it already is if we don't pay attention to what the experts, the scientists are telling us. Absolutely. So, and yes, and we have a lot of, um, uh, Native Americans who are scientists and who are working in the field of medicine and uh, uh, all of these areas that relate to the coronavirus. So we have our own experts we can look to as well. Very much so. And I feel for a lot of folks, uh, the Navajo Nation, there's an incredible impact in uh, the Navajo Nation. And we started looking at, uh, at different places around in Indian country and saying, how bad is it affecting us? You start looking at the infrastructure and the amount of health care available to it. And, uh, and that's a, a real challenge. You, do we have test kits? Do we know who's sick? Do we know an understanding of really how many people actually have it or have had it? Because that influences what we do. Um, right. And unfortunately, I don't think, you know, limited supplies is what they are. I, I can't get one. Unless you have symptoms, you can't, you can't get a test because they don't have enough tests. Yeah. And that's not that's, right. <laughs> that's uh, coming, they say. Um, so before we go, you uh, also did a cross-country bike um, tour, and you along the way had kids, students work on math problems and such. Is that archived online someplace that people can go back and, you know, if they're looking for something to do to look at those math problems that you gave out? No, it, it used to be. It's, I, I closed down that website some time ago. Um, it's called Rocket Trek. 
I still have all the data. I still have all, all of it. And, and I was thinking at some point in time, I'm going to put it back onto a website uh, to make it accessible. So maybe just, I have time on my hands. Hey, maybe <laughs> that's what you can do. <laughs> I pulled off my computer and figure a way to, to put it back on the system. But it was fun. I, I engaged a lot of kids. I engaged teachers. It was, it was a good time. It really has changed my life. It really did. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks, Patty. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Wash your hands. Social distance. We hope you enjoyed this encore interview with John Harrington. Uma umukatsi ukkalyani. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Tholohungva. Join us again tomorrow. Indian country today.